Born in London in 86, Sasho Dent named Richard Parliament. He loves to wrestle, but he loves one more thing, and belts round the world. He fights in his comments and he argues with fans. It's a problem no one understands. If there's two things he loves, it's getting an, and belts round the world. Drinking fine wine, fighting fanboys, handhelds round the world. Top Hat Gaming Man. Hello ladies and gentlemen, Top Pack Gaming Man here. On this channel over the last few years, we have looked at a number of different handheld gaming devices from the Turbo Express, the Wonderswan and the Mega Duck. Right at the beginning though, the very first episode of Handhelds Around the World I ever made was on the humble original Game Boy, one of the most beloved and most popular handheld systems of all time. This was over two years ago though, back when I was still finding my feet in terms of content creation, so I did not go particularly deep in paying homage to this very fantastic creation. Today though is going to be a very different story, as we look at every nook and cranny of the console's history and remember many of the amazing games this system has to offer. This, ladies and gentlemen, is my definitive Game Boy documentary. Yeah! In the years leading up to the release of the Nintendo Game Boy, Nintendo had found success in the home console market, dominating Japan with their Famicom, and in North America with their system variant known as the Nintendo Entertainment System. As we all know, this event took place throughout the mid-1980s, Prior to all of Nintendo's success in both the handheld and home console market, another company made a huge breakthrough and this company was known as Milton Bradley, a Massachusetts based company who you may know, who are most famous for manufacturing board games. In the 1970s, Milton Bradley began to dabble with electronic gaming and by 1978 created the device known as Simon which was an electronic game of memory skill invented by Ralph H. Bear and Howard J. Morrison. These were a lot of fun, and I remember seeing these things around frequently as a child. It was the next year in 1979 though, where Milton Bradley conceived the Game Boy's earliest ancestor, the MB Microvision. The Microvision was a groundbreaking piece of technology as it was the world's first ever handheld gaming device with interchangeable cartridges. For those who have been watching my channel for a while, you may remember that I made an entire in-depth video on this extremely influential platform. The games were as basic and simple as they came, and ran on a small LCD screen. The system's portability and interchangeable cartridges gave the system some moderate success and grossed MB $15 million in the first year alone. The Microvision and its innovative technology soon caught Nintendo's attention. Satoru Akada, the former head of Nintendo's Research and Development 1 department, stated that the Microvision technology is responsible to giving birth to the Game Boy's next ancestor, the Game & Watch, Nintendo's first ever handheld gaming device. Nintendo employee Gunpei Yokoi found inspiration for the Game & Watch whilst riding a bullet train in 1979. Gunpei noticed a bored businessman fiddling with an LCD calculator to pass time. This incident inspired him to have an idea to create a watch which you could play games on to kill the time. Sadly, through the research I have undertaken, I cannot tell you whether this incident or the release of the Microvision happened first. All I can validate is that all of this apparently happened in the same year. Either way, by the time 1980 came around, Nintendo used the Microvision technology to realise Gunpei's idea somewhat. Yokoi designed a whole series of electronic handhelds known as Nintendo Game & Watches. These devices included digital time displays to function as a watch and more importantly, simple addictive LCD games. There were 60 different Game & Watch models throughout the product's life cycle. It is notable that these devices were the first to include the famous Nintendo D-Pad, 
This control screen was so functional that it would become a standard for all Nintendo gaming consoles going forward, until it was finally removed on the Nintendo Switch. Some of the later Game & Watches also had a dual screen feature, which was the inspiration for the later design of the Nintendo DS range. Away from handheld gaming, Gunpei Yokoi worked on a number of other Nintendo projects, which included working with Miyamoto on the production of both Donkey Kong and Mario Brothers, and later producing both Metroid and Kid Icarus for the NES. His career crowning glory though would not arrive until after all of this, and that was with the arrival of his magnum opus the creation of the Nintendo Game Boy in 1989, the very topic of this video. When looking at the Nintendo Game Boy, it is easy to see that it is an extremely basic piece of technology, even by 1989 standards. If you look at the Game Boy's main competitors, the Atari Lynx, PC Engine GT and Sega Game Gear, you can see that in terms of technical specification, they are all a completely different level to that of the Game Boy. The Game Boy was an 8-bit handheld console that supported interchangeable cartridges, although its screen could only display games in four colours of grey. Amongst the reasons as to why the Game Boy was such a simple piece of equipment relates to Gunpei's philosophy of what he articulated as applying lateral thinking to wither technology. Gunpei stated that the Nintendo way of adapting technology is not to look for the state of the art, but to utilise mature technology that can be mass produced cheaply. In regards to this philosophy, wither technology refers to the mature technology, which is cheap and well understood, and lateral thinking refers to finding radical new ways of using such technology. Overall, Yokoi's disclusion of a full colour display for the Nintendo Game Boy led to cheaper production costs and a much stronger battery life than that of the main competitor systems. This convenience and simplicity is arguably the key factor that led to Nintendo dominating the handheld market, both then and for aeons to come. Whilst today, history now speaks for itself regarding the success of the Nintendo Game Boy, Nintendo were not always as confident in how the product would perform. An internal joke has surfaced regarding the original internal code name for the Game Boy, which was the Dot Matrix game. This name's initials ended up being featured on the back of the final product, with the model number DMG01. Due to this model number, employees of the company used these initials to nickname the system the Dame Game, with Dame being the Japanese word for hopeless or lame. However, the Game Boy went on to prove its detractors wrong, shifting a whopping 118 million units in its long life cycle. In 1989, the Game Boy saw a release in Japan in April of 1989, and released with just four different titles, which were Alleyway, Baseball, Yakuman, and most notably, Super Mario Land. Super Mario Land was the first ever Mario game which did not involve the mascot's fabled creator Shigeru Miyamoto. The game was produced by Gunpei Yokoi himself, and featured completely new environments for the franchise, depicted in line art. The game takes Mario away from the Mushroom Kingdom and to Sarasaland to save Princess Daisy in her debut game. The game includes your normal moving to the right and jumping across platforms to avoid enemies and pitfalls. However, control-wise, the game feels quite different and significantly floatier. Boldly, the game also includes two Gradius-style shooter levels, which sets this game distantly apart from most of the other titles within this franchise. Overall, it's a very unique Mario title. The game worldwide eventually sold 18 million copies. July of 1989 saw the North American launch of the Game Boy, and the system added another iconic title to its launch lineup, and this game was Tetris, the famous Russian puzzle game created by Alexei Pajanov. Nintendo managed to procure the exclusive handheld rights to this addictive simple game, where you manipulated blocks in order to create horizontal lines without gaps. This game was extremely important to Nintendo, as they used it as a product to market towards a more mature audience rather than just simply children. 
promotion of the Game Boy advised that Tetris was the perfect pastime for businessmen on the move, which in a way echoes back to Gunpei's vision where he saw a man fiddling with a calculator on a train all those years before. The Game Boy version of Tetris was nearly twice as popular as Super Mario, selling an astonishing 35 million units in total. The following year, 1990, saw the release of the Game Boy in Europe and went on to become Nintendo's first truly popular Nintendo platform across the region. In most European countries, the Nintendo Entertainment System had previously been vastly outsold by the likes of the Sega Master System, the Commodore 64, ZX Spectrum and even the Amstrad CPC 464. The Game Boy was a different kettle of fish altogether though and sold like hotcakes. 1990 also saw the release of some great new games for the platform, which we're going to talk about now. An extremely early game for the Famicom was Balloon Fight back in 1983. The Game Boy saw a sequel to this title known as Balloon Kid, which built on its predecessor immensely. The object of the main game is to travel from the beginning to the end of each stage, collecting balloons left by Alice's brother Jim along the way. The player must also prevent Alice from bumping into enemies that are attempting to pop her balloons, push her or kill her altogether. This is a Game Boy gem in which I feel many people for some reason seem to overlook. Another strange factoid about this game is that it was not released in Japan until 1992, and the sprites were changed and the game was rebranded as Hello Kitty. Pretty bizarre stuff really. Batman on the Game Boy, like Batman on the NES, was developed by Sunsoft, however it is a completely different game in its own right. The game is a fun run and gun shooter and one of the most enjoyable very early games within the Game Boy's library. DuckTales is a direct port of the NES game and this was the version of the game I experienced myself as a child. I was not even aware of the entertainment system's more famous version. In this side-scrolling action platformer, you play as Scrooge McDuck as you use your pogo stick to assist you through a number of stages. The game also features some fine music, however I cannot illustrate this in this video since Sony are pretty protectionists over the music in this game for some reason. I guess it probably has something to do with the remastered version of this game which can be found on the PlayStation 3. Following on from Tetris, the next highly addictive puzzle game to feature on the Game Boy platform was Dr. Mario. This was yet another game produced by Gunpei Yokoi, and the influence of Tetris is on full display here. The player's objective is to destroy the viruses populating the on-screen playing field by using coloured capsules that are tossed into the field by Mario himself, who assumes the role of a doctor. Personally, I do not think this game is quite as addictive as Tetris, however the game stands out in its own right as a classic today. Moving forward into 1991, the Game Boy continued to see a fairly fast paced release schedule with lots of classics released. The year included the debut on the platform of even more franchises that had managed to make a name for themselves on the NES, who now wanted to try their hand within the handheld gaming arena. Earlier in this video, I mentioned that Gunpei Yokoi produced both the Kid Icarus and Metroid games on the NES. 1991 saw both of these franchises arriving on the small screen. In Metroid 2, the gameplay involves killing a fixed number of Metroids before you can advance deeper through the planet's tunnels. Personally, this game used to always wind me up as a child, as, in my opinion, the black and white made everything in this title look the bloody same. I have heard there are now much better ways to experience this game, such as the games reimagining on the Nintendo 3DS, and prior to that there was apparently a superior homebrew version of the game made as well, which is apparently better than either of the attempts created by Nintendo. Kid Icarus of Myths and Monsters built on the previous game in equal measures to that of which Balloon Kid did with Balloon Fight previously. Unlike the game's predecessor, this game's levels scroll freely in all four directions, which enable you to explore previously visited environments. You also have much more control over your character as you can now flap your wings in midair to slowly descend. The game features great upbeat music too, all in all making this game another underrated classic for the system. Mega Man received his Game Boy debut in 1991 
in Mega Man Dr. Wily's Revenge, one of the five bloody Mega Man games on the Nintendo Game Boy. This first entry in the handheld series takes components of the original Mega Man and Mega Man 2 games from the NES, including their enemies, stage aesthetics and robot masters. In total, across the NES and the Game Boy, there were 11 different Mega Man games released in quick succession, which for me personally gives me extreme franchise fatigue. I am yet to put any real time into the Game Boy iterations as of yet. There's just too much bloody Mega Man. 1991 also saw Konami release Castlevania 2 Belmont's Revenge on the Nintendo Game Boy, the only solid Castlevania game to appear on the original system. The game is your simple side-scrolling classic Castlevania affair, and this is the first Castlevania Game Boy game to include sub-weapons. If you would like to learn more about Castlevania games on Nintendo handhelds, I made a video on the history of all of them when I was at Dracula's Castle last year, if you would like to check it out. Final Fantasy Adventure was the first big action RPG on the Game Boy, and a bloody good one at that. The game features a similar playstyle to The Legend of Zelda, but also features some more traditional role playing game elements, such as levelling up. The game is known as Seiken Densetsu in Japan and is the direct prequel to The Secret of Mana on the Super Nintendo, making this the first game in the Mana series, which also shares a similar playstyle. The game is simply known as Mystic Quest in Europe as none of the previous Final Fantasy games had seen a release in the region, due to the NES's lack of success. Faceball 2000 is a pretty futuristic sounding name for 1991. After all, the new millennium was still another nine years away. Prior to that of even Wolfenstein 3D and Doom, the Game Boy, believe it or not, had a first person shooter of all things, and a half decent one at that. The game functions surprisingly well, and even more insane perhaps than the graphics themselves, is the fact that this game offered 16 player multiplayer via a link cable, a true technical marvel. 1992 was an interesting year in the Game Boy's life cycle, as quite a few interesting games made their debut. One of these was Kirby's Dream Land. Kirby was the first huge Nintendo franchise to actually see a debut of all things on the Nintendo Game Boy, and was developed by Sakurai of How Laboratories, a man who would go on to become one of the most famous game developers in the world, a man who is well known today as the brain behind the highly lucrative Super Smash Bros. series. His first major glory was his involvement with Kirby's Dream Land, right here on the Game Boy. Kirby's Dream Land plays just as it was intended to. It is an extremely simple pick up and play platformer, which features relaxing music and gameplay. The game also set a number of conventions that will go on to appear in other installments in the franchise. In this simplistic game, Kirby can attack by inhaling and spitting out enemies and also has the ability to fly. The game is extremely easy compared to most side scrolling offerings of the period. However, personally I think this game's ease of play added to the game's flavour, and more importantly, the world would be a bit boring if all platformers were exactly the same. Another fun cutesy platformer I enjoyed for 1992 is Adventure Island. The game features many of the fun power-ups the franchise is renowned for, such as throwable hammers and ridiculous Mondo skateboards which suit the genre of prehistoric caveman gaming absolutely wonderfully. Another fairly overlooked Game Boy game, and its 1993 sequel, Adventure Island 2, is probably just as good. The biggest title to appear on the Game Boy in 1992 was Super Mario's second platforming outing on the system. In Super Mario Land 2, Gunpei Yokoi once again took the reins from Miyamoto, offering a slightly different Mario game, away from all the boring repetitive Mushroom Kingdom tropes of the series. The story is set straight after the Sarasa Land fiasco of the first Super Mario Land game, and features one of the most interesting villains in Nintendo's history, in the form of Wario. Wario was created to be Mario's rival, who was apparently based on Popeye's Bluto somewhat, hence why Wario is larger, stronger and more cunning than his counterpart, 
are normally motivated by self-interests. It is also a well-known gaming factoid that the W on Wario's cap is derived from the Japanese word Wairu, if that's pronounced right, meaning bad. The game is graphically and conceptually a giant leap for the Super Mario Land franchise. Graphically, the game looks quite similar to that of Super Mario World, and the player has a lot of choices using the overworld map over which level to tackle first. The game also features fun new power-ups, such as the bunny ears, and interesting levels such as the one set in space where Mario wears a spacesuit and gravity functions differently. All in all, Super Mario Land 2 is amongst the most memorable games on the Game Boy platform, and the last true side-scrolling Mario game until another 14 years later, with the debut of new Super Mario Bros. for the DS. Moving into 1993, history was made by Nintendo yet again, when they released a full-scale Link to the Past-like experience on the platform, in the form of The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening. Nintendo were on a roll. The legendary Shigeru Miyamoto took the helm this time around with a game which was originally just going to be a scaled-down port of Link to the Past. The game slowly morphed into a different project though entirely, and into one of the most memorable Zelda games of all time. Like Mario Land games before it, Link is taken out of his usual setting as the game is set outside of Hyrule. The game plays very similarly to Link to the Past though, where you make your way around the land, discovering dungeons and using the weapons within to explore and defeat bosses. This game is yet another Game Boy all-time classic. 1993 also saw the quick return of Kirby to the platform, this time in Kirby's Pinball Land. This game was a childhood favourite of mine, where you work your way through three tables attempting to defeat a boss at the end of each one. Bizarrely, this game's difficulty is in complete contrast to Dream Land, and is one of the most difficult games on the entire Game Boy. I have no idea how I had the patience to play this game so much looking back. Kid Dracula is a cutesy Castlevania spin-off, which is a sequel to a game that remained a Japanese Famicom exclusive. The game is yet another overlooked fun platformer for the system, and if you were so bold as to classify it as a Castlevania game itself, it is probably the best one on the entire platform. Moving into 1994, an extremely cool add-on was developed for the Super Nintendo. The Nintendo Super Game Boy was released, a device which let you slot your Game Boy games straight into the Super Nintendo. This was a fantastic breakthrough, as it did not always feel ideal playing games on that tiny blurry green screen all the time. Sometimes your eyes needed a jolly good rest. The device had more functionality than simply letting you play games on a television though, as you could now choose which four colours you played your games in, and certain games were even developed to be fully colourised once inserted into the Super Game Boy. One of the most notable examples of this was Donkey Kong, which was a complete reimagining of the 1980s arcade game from back in the day. In this game you once again played as Mario trying to rescue his girlfriend Pauline from Donkey Kong, he started the game off playing the original four arcade levels, only to soon find out there was a whopping 97 more bloody levels. Fantastic! The new 97 levels featured a new mechanic, in which the player must guide Mario through each level to locate a key. An amazing little game! An often extremely overlooked game from 1994, and one of my favourite childhood games on the system, was Monster Max. Personally, I think this game only really gets lost in the shuffle due to it being a European exclusive. So, with most Nintendo files being Americans, they are less likely to talk about this one. This is an amazing isometric adventure game, designed by the legendary John Rittman and Bernie Drummond, the mastermind behind Batman and Head Over Heels on the ZX Spectrum. Two more fantastic games which feature very similar playstyles. It is an almost offensive how good yet how overlooked this game is. Next up, we have a big one. Wario Land, Super Mario Land 3. The first Nintendo game where you get to play as a villain. The game once again starts off where the previous Mario Land game left off and this game was so successful and well received that it led to Wario receiving franchises of his very own right up until this very day. The game features gameplay which is once again extremely different from the previous two Mario Land games. 
Wario is able to jump on or bump into enemies to knock them over. Enemies thus stunned can be picked up and thrown at other enemies. Wario also has a number of his own unique power-ups too. Another glaring difference is that the game differs from any previous Mario games as rather than saving a princess or doing something wholesome, Wario is just there to steal and plunder as much bloody treasure as possible. He reminds me a lot of myself. I cannot even begin to tell you of what a great breath of fresh air this game was on release. So relatable and such an all time classic. Moving into 1995, this was a period in time which Game Boy history began to get a little bit weird. The system was now six years old, so in many ways Nintendo was starting to look at the platform as a system that had had its time in the sun already and that perhaps it was time to go home soon. They did not see a lot of mileage left in their little green screened machine. For this reason, in 1995, Gunpei Yokoi designed and released the sequel to the Nintendo Game Boy, the Nintendo Virtual Boy, one of the biggest commercial failures in all of Nintendo history. Once again, Gunpei had attempted to apply lateral thinking to wither technology to come up with something both functional and marketable. But sadly, this time around, the product failed on both fronts. This red and black graphic 3D monstrosity is one of the most uncomfortable devices to use in all of gaming history. The system only ended up being on the market for a year in total and there were only 22 different games released for the platform. The Virtual Boy was everything the Game Boy wasn't. It was high priced, lacked portability and featured games of questionable quality. So, with all this in mind, the Game Boy remained Nintendo's go-to portable gaming device. Whilst all of this was going on, Nintendo decided to give their Game Boy marketing a bit of an oomph by introducing the Play It Loud marketing campaign, in which they released original Game Boy units in a range of new snazzy colours. Some of these are less common than others, like this green one I have here. However, there is also a white unit which remained exclusive to Japan and a red unit with a Manchester United logo emblazed on it, Ugh, which was sold in the UK. During this period of nonsense, the Game Boy still saw some decent games though, including the release of the first Donkey Kong Land game. The game was published on a striking banana yellow cartridge and was a full blown spin off of the Donkey Kong Country series. The game featured the same impressive character models and similar large levels and gameplay to that of its Super Nintendo counterpart. Despite all of the similarities though, the game features its own story and levels in its own right. The game was very successful and in turn led to two more Donkey Kong Land games on the Game Boy. Kirby's Dream Land 2 saw a 1995 release. This high quality, side scrolling platformer features many of the same tropes of the previous game. However, the game this time features animal friends for Kirby to ride through the stages on. Nothing new or groundbreaking here really took place, but this was another fine entry that continued to secure the Game Boy's library as one of the strongest ever. With the Virtual Boy flopping and the original Game Boy aging, by 1996 it was time for a hardware revision for Nintendo. This year saw the launch of the Game Boy Pocket. The Game Boy Pocket was smaller and lighter and took just two AAA batteries as opposed to the four AA ones. The screen was larger and was changed to a true black and white display rather than the pea suit monochromatic display of the original Game Boy. This new screen offered a better picture with improved visibility and better pixel response time, all in all making the Game Boy Pocket another hit for Nintendo. The year of the Game Boy Pocket also saw one of the Game Boy's most popular games pop up from an almost seemingly out of nowhere. 1996 saw the release of Pokemon Red and Green version in Japan, the crazy JRPG where you have to capture and battle 150 Pokemon. The game was slowly rolled out across planet Earth over a number of years and further prolonged the Game Boy's lifespan for much longer than anyone would have ever expected. I can even remember people busting out original Game Boys whilst I was in secondary school in the late 90s, which was all due to the release of one of the most addictive games that has ever been released in history. This game was like crack cocaine, and no one could stop playing it, or even put it down. I played this game so much that I emblazoned the game's 8-bit music in my head so badly that I would have to get up in the middle of the night 
to check if I left my Game Boy on, as I could still bloody hear it. What an amazing game for a simple handheld. A game which was so spectacular that many new fans bought a Nintendo Game Boy specifically just so they could play this game. Pokemon gave the Game Boy a long Indian summer indeed. One of the more melancholy things that took place in 1996 was the departure of Gunpei himself from Nintendo. The leader of the Game Boy project was finally moving on from the company to new pastures and although this was sad to see at the time, it was interesting to imagine what he would go on to achieve elsewhere over the years. Many have speculated he left Nintendo after the embarrassment which was the Nintendo Virtual Boy, however Gunpei has stated himself this was all purely coincidental. Moving into 1997, Gunpei would end up working for Bandai, and under Gunpei's supervision, Bandai would end up developing an exciting ultra-powerful 32-bit handheld of their very own, known as the Bandai Wonderswan. This was to compete directly against Gunpei's very own former creation. In this same year, while striving on the Hokuriku Expressway, Gunpei was involved in a road traffic accident and rear-ended a truck. Miraculously, the man was fine, but sadly was hit by another car as he got out to inspect the damage. The man who invented the Game Boy was sadly gone forever. As for Bandai, the Wonder Swan would not see release until 1999. So sadly, Gunpei never got to see his final creation hit the market. In the new era of Gunpei-less Nintendo, the Game Boy Camera saw a release in 1998. This device allowed players to take selfies on their monochrome screens, edit the images and even put their faces into very basic games. Nintendo had brought forth taking selfies many years before the term had even been invented. Innovative, eh? Along with the Game Boy Camera, there was also the Game Boy Printer, which would allow you to turn your selfies into stickers. All in all, I found these very fun and innovative toys indeed. 1998 also saw the release of Wario Land 2 on the platform, which was hoping to cash in on some of the previous success Wario had had. The game differed massively from the previous Wario game, as this game took the unconventional step of making Wario completely invincible, which was unheard of in the platforming genre at the time. The game's challenge instead come mostly through impeding players' progress by implementing physical obstacles, puzzle solving, paths blocked by treasure locks or forcing Wario back to previously visited areas. The game innovates and is no doubt a fun affair, but I still prefer the previous instalment though. In April of that same year, a Japan exclusive type of Game Boy was released known as the Game Boy Lite. The Game Boy Lite was very similar to the Game Boy Pocket, however slightly taller and included an additional built-in backlit screen, much like the device's name suggests. However today, the Game Boy Lite remains nothing more than a footnote. As of October that year, Nintendo finally released the Game Boy's true successor system, the Game Boy Color. After nearly a 10 year run, Nintendo were finally ready to begin fading the black and white system out. However, due to its large install base, Nintendo did so extremely carefully. Not only was the Game Boy Color fully backwards compatible so you can continue to enjoy all of your old library, but the early Game Boy Color games themselves were backwards compatible too, so you could still play them in your original Game Boy. The original Game Boy was faded out extremely carefully, which I suppose is testament to how much Nintendo and the rest of the world valued this amazing product. After the Game Boy Color was only on the market for two years, Nintendo were beginning to get spooked by Gunpei's successor system, the 32-bit gaming platform, the Wonderswan. Nintendo made the bold move in 2001 to release their very own 32-bit handheld to go up against the Wonderswan Color. Much to the original Game Boy's credit, this brand new system still remained backwards compatible with Game Boy cartridges, becoming the first Nintendo system which was compatible with three different generations of games. The last devices released by Nintendo which could play original Game Boy cartridges came in 2003 with the revised model of the GBA known as the GBA SP 
and the Nintendo GameCube add-on device, the Game Boy Player. The GBASP lets you play your old library on a handheld with a rechargeable flip screen and with a backlight, whilst the Game Boy Player let you play your Game Boy games, Game Boy Color games and Advance games all on your television. For a while, the original Game Boy had had its day, and no official ways were released to play the cartridges ever again. But in 2011, the Game Boy library raised its head once more, so that people could buy, download and play classic Nintendo games on their 3DS Portable. Playing Game Boy games on this beautiful screen is an event in itself, I suppose. Beautiful. The original Game Boy has one of the most rich and impressive runs in all of gaming history. Nintendo managed to successfully get so much mileage out of such a simple device. The platform's library and overall quality speaks for itself, and I will always remember the Nintendo Game Boy as the most influential handheld gaming device in the history of mankind. So, ladies and gentlemen, we will shortly be bringing this video to a close. That was my effort at attempting to create a definitive documentary all about the Nintendo Game Boy. I try to include as many key games and events as possible. What would you like to see me include if I am ever bold enough to attempt a director's cut in the future? Let me know in the comment section. Also, why not share with us some of your fondest Game Boy memories? If you like this video, please do not forget to like, comment and subscribe for super in-depth content on this channel every single week without fail. Also, it would help this channel out massively if you hit the notification bell to stay notified and receive these sort of videos straight to your phone. I am motivated to go to such lengths to create this sort of content partly due to the fantastic support and donations I receive on Patreon. I love you people so much. So shout outs to Carl Johnson, Shizuka Kobayashi, Andy Aldridge, Richard Clark, Michael Keneally, Greg Hooper, Harold Webb, Since Spaces, Kevin Fahaley, David Mountford, Andrew Bazanski, Edward O'Reilly, Peter Dawn, Tom Elliott, Mark S. Hines, Gary Pinkett, The Gaming Muso, and all of my other patrons. You people motivate me to no end when it comes to pumping in hundreds of hours of work into my channel all the time. So as always, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. Cheerio.